to Gambling with an Edge with your hosts, Bob Dancer and Richard Munchkin. Bob Dancer is America's premier video poker writer and teacher. He's written 10 books, including Video Poker for the Intelligent Beginner and the best-selling Million Dollar Video Poker. He helped develop the computer software Video Poker for Winners, and in 2004, he was inducted into the Video Poker Hall of Fame. Richard Munchkin has been a professional advantage player for over 30 years and is in the Blackjack Hall of Fame. His book, Gambling Wizards, Conversations with the World's Greatest Gamblers, is a testament to the many ways you can succeed at gambling. The goal of the show is that you'll be a more knowledgeable gambler tomorrow than you were yesterday. And now, here are Bob and Richard. Good afternoon. Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. I'm Bob Dancer. And I'm Richard Munchkin. Today we're talking to Professor David G. Schwartz, who directs the Center for Gaming Research at UNLV. Today we'll be talking about his most recent book, Boardwalk Playground, along with some of his recent writings for Vegas 7 magazine. Before we talk to Dr. Schwartz, we received a question from a listener addressed to gamblingwithanedge at gmail.com. This listener wants to know if electronic blackjack machines are a way to count cards successfully without the heat usually found in live games. Richard? Uh, no, unfortunately not. Um, some of the early machines dealt a, um, well, some of them dealt a, si a single deck game where you might have five or six spots, but you're only playing one round, uh, which is still a pretty poor counting game. And then there was a, a machine that for a while was dealing two decks out of six, and then it would shuffle, but they didn't tell you uh, when they were shuffling. Uh, but there were ways to beat that counting cards. Uh, but the current ones, uh, most of them are dealing six to five blackjack, and, and one of the things that's really interesting is they're dealing six to five, but every spot is being dealt from a different 52-card deck, including the dealer's hand. So you could, you could have a seven of clubs and your neighbor could have a seven of clubs and the dealer could have a seven of car clubs and uh each spot has its own 52 card deck and, and is only one hand being dealt for before it's shuffled and it's paying six to five so sounds like a lot of good reasons not to play that game well actually those games were still very good um for a long time because of the cashback um because the theos on them were really high but the you know like all all good things come to an end eventually, and the f casinos have figured out they had the, cas the Theo set way too high on those machines. Uh -huh. High Times, which is a magazine for marijuana devotees, is talking about opening up a casino. Now, it's been 35 years since I smoked the stuff, but I used to sometimes play backgammon back then under the influence. My results suffered, go figure. If I owned a casino, I would like my customers to be high on pot. That would be good for my bottom line. Richard, have you heard anything about this? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's no immediate plans for this. But, uh, yeah, I, I, it's a funny idea. I remember years ago when the Grateful Dead uh, played here in Las Vegas. And uh, that was a crazy time. You would have groups of people in tie-dyed t-shirts standing around the roulette wheels just watching the colors spin around <laughs> so uh that yeah. sounds cool <laughs> yeah groovy man all right <laughs> let's talk to uh david schwartz he's a history professor at unlv along with being director of the same center for gaming research he writes a regular green felt jungle column for vegas 7 magazine he was on our show previously talking about his book Grandissimo, which was a biography of Jay Sarno. Tonight, we're going to be talking about his new book, Boardwalk Playground. Professor Schwartz, welcome to Gambling with an Edge. Thanks for having me back. Why don't you start off by spending five minutes or so telling us how your new book came about? Richard and I will have some questions for you afterwards. Sure, and feel free to interject. So... I wrote, started writing a column for Roger Gross and Casino Connection magazine uh, quite a while ago, like more than 10 years ago. And the column was a, it was a little 
you know, end of the magazine thing, Atlantic City history and a bunch of different topics and just pick any topic, write about it. So, you know, it could be the first boardwalk, Lucy the Elephant, stuff like that. And, you know, I, I got to do a lot of the, the classic hotels, started with them. And then as time went on, I said, well, I think I'll start to do some of the casinos. So, you know, resorts, valleys, some of the early casinos. So the I had a pretty good base of short little articles about Atlantic City history. Uh, last summer, I had a couple of projects end up and I had some time and I said, you know what? Now with all the stuff the city is going through, I really think it would be nice to do a book about Atlantic City's history and have that out there. So I used the articles I'd done for Roger and Casino Connection Magazine as a base. Now, backtracking a little bit, the thing about Casino Connection Magazine is that it was a magazine geared towards casino employees of which I used to be one. So I felt very strongly about writing for it, you know, in a positive sense, not strongly in negative sense, positive in a positive sense, because it's kind of nice to have something to read when you're on your lunch break. And, you know, no matter which shift you are, it's a lunch break. So my goal of writing the columns is always saying, hey, look, if I had five minutes and I was sitting next to somebody in the employee cafeteria and they said, hey, Dave, you know, what can you tell me about, ah, what can you tell me about history? What would I say to him? What would I say to him? That was the the spirit that I wrote the column in. So I took that same spirit and applied it to the book, but saying, okay, now they've got a little bit more time, but I'm still giving them little short snapshots of history. You know, what should I write about? So I expanded it, added some chapters, covered some things I hadn't covered, and the result is Boardwalk Playground. To the, the two most fascinating um, periods to me in Atlantic City um, are first the the uh, prohibition era mm-hmm. uh, which was uh, shown in boardwalk Empire which I want to uh, get to and and the other period that's really interesting is when resorts international first opened it, you know the first casino outside Nevada but uh, so I want to let's start with prohibition um, first of all did you watch boardwalk Empire and were you a fan of that show? I actually never got around to that. You know, oh, I, don't, okay. I don't have HBO, so I never got around to that. Although I've heard a lot of good stuff about it. Yeah. You know, someday, I, I'll, I guess I'll put it on the bucket list. Yeah. So, well, but there was this character. The, the main character in the show was this guy in the show, Nucky Thompson. But mm-hmm. the, the guy is a real guy whose name was Nucky Johnson. Yeah. And um, so he basically ran the politics of Atlantic City and uh, made a deal with gangsters to allow them to import alcohol through Atlantic City. And that's correct? That's basically... Yeah, you know, a lot of that, when you start talking about it, a lot of that stuff starts to get in conjecture. You know, the the agreement was supposedly in 1929, which is a little bit late in Prohibition. You know, Prohibition started in 1920. You know, there definitely was some kind of meeting, though. And uh, Johnson definitely was one of the power brokers in, in uh, that whole era. So, yeah, I think it really did happen. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, basically, he just made it a port for them to import import the whiskey through there and guaranteed its uh, safety, its transit. Uh, yeah, and this is really interesting, and this is something I captured in the book because you had this battle going on in Atlantic City itself where you had pretty much open flouting of prohibition, and some people in the city were really upset about it, and every now and then they would have a raid, and, you know, I talk about some of the raids in, in my chapter on Prohibition and it's kind of, it gets kind of funny sometimes because they're raiding places and like, wow, you really are so surprised. You know, it's like, uh, you know, Casablanca, I'm shocked to discover there's alcohol in Atlantic <laughs> City. So you get into that. And, you know, at the same time, clearly a big part of the city's appeal is it is a place you can go and you can get this stuff. So it, it's, it's a very dualistic thing. Yeah, there were kind of a lot of cities in America back in our history that were like that, right? Hot Springs, Arkansas, yeah. for a time, was a big gambling mecca um, illegally. Uh, Newport, Kentucky was another one. Uh, Dallas, b- before Benny, and including Benny Binion, oh, yeah. would fit into that category. Yeah, yeah. Your friend, uh, your colleague, Doug, Doug Swanson's book on Benny Binion was, we were on this, Blood Aces, I think it was, hmm. was... Uh, he was a guest a year or so ago. Yeah. Huh, interesting. Yeah. Um, but this is gangsters. Uh, now Vegas definitely has a gangster connection. 
uh, organized crime. And these are the two biggest... Well, Vegas still is. I don't know if Atlantic City's in second place is to, to Ungambling City. But they have this common ground of organized crime. Is this coincidence or is this... Are there roots there or threads there? Well, I think you see that in a lot of cities. Certainly, if you look at, at Miami, you know, South Florida, there's a ton of that there. You know, even as far as prohibition goes, you can look at other cities like Cleveland, where Mo Dalitz was very active. You know, pretty much any place that has access to another part of the country is going to be big in prohibition. And it goes without saying, New York City and Chicago, too, are, are huge for organized crime. But they didn't become huge in gambling sense. Vegas and Atlantic City became huge gambling centers. And so I'm wondering about the connection between organized crime. Well, the orga- before it was legal, the organized crime people were the ones who were running it. So once you make it legal, they are the experts, right? They're, it's a business they know. They're going to jump into it with both feet as soon as they can, right? Um, you know, they did down in Cuba before Castro. So... Yeah, to me, it just makes sense. Although Atlantic City, when they passed legalized gambling, um, it seemed like they went really, really strict in terms of limiting who could be involved in the casinos just to avoid uh, that aspect, right? And even Del Webb, who was a big figure here in Nevada, Mm -hmm. had problems in New Jersey. Well, Hilton was denied a license or what didn't get a license. I don't know if they, they withdrew or whatever, but Hilton didn't get a license. Hugh Hefner had a license and lost the license with Playboy. They didn't give them a permanent license, and Elsinore had to totally buy them out. So there was a lot of people who had regulatory issues in Atlantic City. You know, even it's it's gotten better, but back when I first was working in the industry, to have any job in the casino at all, you had to do a huge application. And, you know, that's even to be a bus boy or anything. anything you do a huge application where you're listing all your relatives and your bank account information and whether you have any mob ties and very i'm very happy to say that on three times i was licensed by the state of new jersey they found i had good character and no discernible mob ties <laughs> oh. so now, good if you for tried that. for a fourth time do you think you'd pass again i, I would hope so I would uh, hope it so. seems though that the the um uh, Casino commission there has has gotten steadily weaker and weaker. I don't know if that's because of budget concerns or I mean it used to be they had a presence in the cuz physically yeah. in the casino 24 hours a day. And now trying to get a gaming agent, you know, it's uh very difficult to do. Yeah, and that definitely was expensive and that was something where the casinos had to have the office for them and they had to pay to have them there. And that goes to a whole bigger issue where they were involved in the operations. You know, when I was doing security, if we wanted to go on a soft count or hard count, we there's two keys and you need the commission there. If you wanted to open up a slot base, you needed someone from the an inspector from the commission there. And that's just a huge, you know, most business would, would say this is so intrusive. Imagine if your 7-Eleven, if to open the, the cash register and count down to the end of your shift, you needed somebody to come in and do it with you so really intrusive hmm. yeah especially if you wanted to skim it would be terrible. <laughs> well which okay. is the whole which is the whole point yeah now atlantic city has had some really big ups and downs right now it's fair to call it a down period maybe one of the premises of your book is that atlantic city has always been a phoenix rising up from the dead and you think they will do it again. What's your prediction as to how Atlantic City will reinvent itself this time? Well, I think they've got to shift away from gambling because they were for many years a really good convenience gambling market. And the, the, I don't want to call it a tragedy, but the, the way it all happened was that the money was so good and so easy that I think there wasn't any incentive for innovation. So if you go back to 1985, You've got 2,000 quarter slot machines and they're making a ton of money. Why do anything else? You know, why try to build the Mirage or the Venetian or something like that? There's no, you know, you look like an idiot if you do it because everybody else is making so much money. Well, or try to branch out the way Vegas has into the convention business and into, uh, well, now it's the club business, but 
yeah, Vegas seems to be trying to expand into areas other than gambling. So, which was one of the premises, premises, yeah, premises of the original uh, introduction of gaming in Atlantic City. It was all right. We are doing this to build up the convention base, and when they first came out, when it first, even when the when the decision was first announced. Convention groups are saying, okay, we're going to come back to Atlantic City because they're going to have better hotel rooms. The whole thing is we're going to have better hotel rooms to have better conventions. And they kind of, you know, they kind of did an okay job with that, but they never really followed through to the extent that Vegas did. And if I can take a second to digress even more, of course, a lot, you go back to the sort of primordial shame that provoked the referenda, because there's two of them, to adopt casino gambling. And we go back to... Lyndon Johnson and the 1964 Democratic National Convention, which is held in Atlantic City. Convention itself wasn't that dramatic because they knew that Johnson was going to be renominated. But the reporters focused on writing about how crappy Atlantic City had become. And if you look at the articles, there was like, oh, yeah, it's really run down. And they didn't have a lot of hotels. And the people there were really surly. You know, the people in Atlantic City, you know, growing up, you know, I heard from people, you know, ah, the Democrats are so cheap. I got stiff the whole weekend that they were here. You know, they didn't tip. And that's all, all you heard. So imagine that resentment kind of carrying through 20 years later what it was at the time. So it was, it was I think there was a little bit to go around on both sides. Probably the delegates could have been a little bit freer with the tips. But if they were treated that way, they weren't. You know, so this is what really said, hey, you guys are in big trouble. The, the past is long gone. Uh, looking at the movie Atlantic City that came out, you know, 79, 80, you get that sense of, yeah, the city's decayed and the casinos are going to try to bring it back. Yeah, but, I mean, basically they built casinos in the middle of a ghetto or, or I mean, yeah, a really depressed area. And it, it I, I, I don't know, I mean, it didn't really change much, did it? Well, the, the other problem is this. They took a portion of the money the casinos made and put it in the Casino Redevelopment Agency, which you would think would be focused in Atlantic City. But that money then went all around the state of New Jersey. So good for other places like Camden and Newark, not so good for Atlantic City. If they had said, we're going to have a concentrated phase program, we're going to work on Northeast Inlet, we're going to then go around the rest of the city work and stuff, you could have seen that they could have, have had some kind of revival and had more middle class housing and had a lot of you know, bigger tax base, which would have kept them out of the problem they're in today. So... The Borgata was the um, was the Mirage built. It was the and it is still uh, quite a few years later is still doing quite well. They tried it again with Ravel and that didn't work so good. The um, so I ne I was never a big player in Atlantic City. Richard, were you there during the counter? Bonanza back in you know I, I was not um, I um, I was here in Vegas um, I uh, I actually was in the airport um, before the experiment I in December of what year was that 79 78 was when resorts opened yeah okay so 78 and uh, I ran in I was flying to Chicago for the Christmas holidays and I ran into the Czech team in the airport. And they said, oh, we're going to Atlantic City. We're going to make a bunch of money. Why don't you come with us? And I was like, no, no, because I had a job at the time. I was a dealer. And, you know, I was going home for the Christmas to see my family. And um, so, no, I didn't go. Uh, I, was, I was still a beginning counter at that time and uh, working at a job and didn't have a bankroll. And... I mean, it sounded like I could have played with them, but, um, you know, I wasn't ready to just quit my job and pack up and go. So, no, I, I really didn't spend any time there at all during that. Uh... But you've heard stories at that time. Like, they used to close the casino for a couple hours a day, and when they opened up again, there were fist fights and races to get to oh, the table. Oh, yeah, there were lines outside the doors, and they would open the doors, and people would sprint to get to the blackjack tables because... Every seat would be taken immediately, and if you didn't have one, 
you uh, now how old were you when that were you old enough Pretty to be in the casino no no yeah. i definitely wasn't um, not when they first opened yeah yeah um but yeah i mean um in my book one of the people in my book cat holbert was there with the ken houston team and and uh uh you know ken wouldn't allow her to play because she was a woman and women can't count cards of course <laughs> You know they're not physically capable, according to, <laughs> according to Ken. So uh, so Cat would you know be at the table to provide an extra spot for Ken so he could spread to two hands or whatever, and then he would end up getting drunk and she would be the one counting and tell him when the count went up and things like that. But it sounds like good times. I mean, a lot of crazy. A stuff lot of happened. vodka grapefruits in yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh. How long did that last, by the way, where they had to, do you know, where they had to close for a certain number of hours? And... They, I've gotten on the book the exact day, the date the 24-hour gaming came in. I'm pretty sure it was early 90s. Oh, that late? Wow. Yeah, it lasted for a while. You know, they had, because originally, and first they went to weekend 24-hour gaming, then all the way through. Huh. All right. You regularly... Write for Vegas 7 Magazine. You are the gaming and hospitality editors. One of your recent articles is about the new T-Mobile Arena that was recently opened at the corner of TROP and Las Vegas Boulevard. Is this arena a big deal for Las Vegas? Uh, I think it is. You know, I think if you look at the history of venues in the Strip, you see that they really have the potential to define that era. You know, certainly... Copa Lounge did for that era, and then later on you've got the Theater for the Performing Arts at the Aladdin, which really expanded the number of people who could come to Vegas, number of touring acts, and even the Grand Garden Arena for MGM did the same. So I think it really does have that potential. And it's not just the arena, but it's also the park there, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Which is sort of their MGM's version of the link or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and I haven't been over there yet, although I do want to go uh, check it out. But I thought it was interesting that, um, was it Jim Murren this week or last week who said, you know, I don't care if people come and don't put a nickel in the slot machine, but I want them to, you know, stay in our rooms, eat our food, drink our liquor. Well, that's what's driving a lot of this, because if you look at the behavior of Vegas visitors, most of them will decide where they're eating when they're here you know so it's not necessarily i think a lot of them who are going to gamble if they're serious gamblers well you've got you know you've got your casual gamblers who are just going to throw money in and never see it back so that's one group and you know that's why you've got places like flamingo and harrah's built all the way up to the to the street but people who are seriously going to gamble i think are going to go where they know they're going to get the best return or at least not get the worst one so that's predetermined but people who are going to eat they're pretty much deciding as they're doing it which is why they've turned all the restaurants facing out now you know it used to be that they'd put them deep into the casino and you have to navigate through the machines to get there and i think they found that people just weren't doing it so that's why they've done that is because they you know it's a better I think the margin is going to be higher for them. It's not as high in food, but for rooms, the margin is higher than it is in the casino. So they'd rather have somebody spending more money to stay in the room and not gambling and then doing other stuff. Hmm. Well, listeners on our show pay attention to what odds they're getting and choose their casinos accordingly. But for a craps player, pretty much it's the same everywhere. Mm Mm-hmm. So he's making his choices based on... Well, except the win went down to double odds, right? Um, yeah. So, but other than that, yeah. But, for the most part... You know, if roulette is your game, I mean, it's... Uh, then you're talking about peripheral stuff, including... Uh, yeah, which, which restaurants you want to yeah. eat in, which... You know, and but a lot of it's also, the, nice you know, the comp rate. If you're not... If you've got a great restaurant, but they're not comping anything, I think that has to factor in. Yeah, it. but... That they bring in big headliners because mm-hmm. when uh, the big headliners play, a certain number of gamblers come in to see them. So yeah. that yeah. has nothing to do with the best odds in the casino. All right. Changing subjects. You're also a member of Nevada's Gaming Policy Commission. You're a busy guy. <laughs> Recently, you've been looking at emerging, excuse me, emerging gaming. What does emerging gaming mean? And what do you think Nevada's approach to it will be? 
Well, first, I've got to say it was a real honor to be named to the commission. And, uh, you know, I'm just really, really honored to be on the commission. Uh, emerging gaming to me is a couple of different things. It is, let me see if I've got all three, well, four of them. Three, we're looking at three of them. Daily fantasy sports, so esports, social gaming is the one we're not looking for. And there's one that I'm blanking on because I'm live on a podcast here that we're not looking for. Throw out some other, any, any other... There's another Skill one, general. Skill-based gaming. gaming, yes. Yeah. Thank you, Richard. Skill-based gaming, good, good. So yeah, you've got skill-based gaming, esports, and daily fantasy sports are the ones that we're talking about. Social gaming, I don't think the commission's going to talk about, but I still have that as one of the emerging gaming things, even though people don't classify it as gambling, but you can use real money for it. You're talking about things it. like My Vegas, where you yeah yeah where you pay real money to get extra spins to yeah. earn. Points you can't really spend anywhere. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, th so that is sounds like a regular casino. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true experience. So, I think that the that the real priority is going to be DFS because that's where most of the money is right now, and you've got people making a lot of money offering DFS. So that's where the move first move is going to be. But I think we also have to look at the skill based and especially esports. I think is an area that we really should look at. Now, esports are are these like handheld monitors where you can bet? Is this in game wagering you're talking about, or well, something else? That's part of it. The whole idea of esports is that you're watching other people play video games, and it is way more in, engaging and interesting than I've made it sound. Yeah, I mean, this is huge, huge around the world now. I mean, some of the biggest, uh, most popular shows on YouTube and biggest money-making shows on YouTube are basically videos of guys playing video games and talking while they play. And it's, I mean, when I first saw this, I thought it was just insanity, like that these guys are making sometimes seven figures videotaping themselves play video games. <laughs> Are they good at trash talking? Uh, yeah, sometimes. <laughs> but but also, I mean, people um, get obsessed with these games. And there are these, especially like in Korea, China, Japan, yeah. there are these big teams where the players on the teams are being paid huge salaries to compete at these video games. Um, and, and I believe that the amount of money involved is bigger than... Um, I I... I'm sure it's more than what's involved in daily fantasy, and I think it may be approaching like sports gambling. That may be true, and that, you know, one of the things I'm trying to do at UNLV with the center is to track a lot of this stuff better because there, there, it's not, it's not like slot machines where they have to report it to a state commission. So we kind of know it'd be kind of nice to if, if we could track that a little bit better. But I think it's it's really huge, and it just shows to me, you know, this is something I learned going back to researching Roll the Bones, my book about the the long history of gambling. Not a totally long book. It's a thick book too. That's, <laughs> that's thicker. Uh, <laughs> but it's that people always have liked to play, and have some kind of money or something like that riding in the outcome. And for the past 50 years or so, we've had people doing it. They'll drive or fly to a casino and sit down in a chair and push buttons on a slot machine or play cards. And I think that might be changing, you know, just like a hundred years ago, you wouldn't dream of how, you know, if you showed somebody from a hundred years ago, a casino anyway, they would say, Oh my God, what are these people doing? This is crazy. You know, even 40 years ago, if you said that, slot machines are going to be the big driver for most casinos. I'd say you're nuts. That's nothing. That's a little old ladies play. Yeah, you right. Know, all the, the money's, go do all the money's in the craps pit. You know, that's where the real money is. You know, bring in Sinatra. He'll bring in the craps players. That's where the real money is. And, you know, the, the percentage of number of craps games, even in Nevada, has shrunk so much. Well, and if you go to Macau, I don't think they even have a crap table. No, they don't. Um, so, so yeah, it just shows that it's always evolving. And I think, you know, one of the things that I tried to do, one of the points I tried to make was, you know what, Nevada's done a pretty good job of evolving, and we need to keep doing that. We can't just get complacent. Well, also, so much of the talk has been about how do we get the millennials, and because uh, they just don't seem interested in slot machines or you know they're just not gambling but this is something they're really interested in and that may be the evolution of all this is is getting into that kind of uh uh 
business. I don't, you know, I don't know how you monetize that, but uh, that's that's a big issue. The other big issue is there's going to be a lot of creative destruction, as the economists like to say, which is what we've seen in the casino industry. You know, if you look, even looking at technology and slot machines. If you look at the big slot machine manufacturers from 50 or 60 years ago, you know, yeah, Bally was one of them, but you also had Mills, you had Jennings, you know, they're not around anymore. Mm. IGT. Bally's isn't either. It was swallowed up by scientific gaming. Yeah. And, you know, IGT just started because Cyred had the distributorship for Bally and got into the scuffle and, hey, I'm going to start my own company and then hooks up with the guys who did draw poker. And that's how, that's how IGT got so big. So. You well, IGT was thing. bought out a couple of years oh, ago yeah, by a big yeah. uh, German company. Yep. Although it did keep the name. Yeah. Now, last week, the head of the American Gaming Association, Jeff Freeman, indicated that he believes legal sports betting in the United States, outside of Nevada, will likely happen in the next few years. From your perspective, is this likely? I don't know, because I don't understand. You know, I think I understand. I don't understand Congress at all. And probably not alone in in, in this yeah. country, you know. It's in in my humble opinion, New Jersey for one missed the boat so big time when they could have legalized sports betting back in the early '90s before PAPSFA took effect. You know, they had that window and they just blew it for whatever. Re- you know, I don't even know why they blew it. I still can't wrap my head around that. But I think this is just such a no-brainer because it's clear that people want to bet on sports. People are doing it in other countries. The sky hasn't fallen. States are already making money off of people gambling. It would be different if gambling was only legal in two or three states. But you've got a situation where states are spending money on advertising to tell people to buy more lottery tickets. You know, and now you guys know, and I know your listeners know, which which the better deal is for the player. You know, the hold on a lottery is 40%, 50%. Hold on, sports betting is like But it's 5%. for the schools, David. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Yeah, and you can see how well that worked. <laughs> but, yeah. But but New Jersey in particular, Atlantic City, they're really pushing for it. Yeah. I mean, stronger than, well, I guess Pennsylvania is too and some of the others, but I, um, it seems like New Jersey needs it. They do, but the thing is, once they get it, I, I don't think the ink's going to be dry before Pennsylvania and New York go into it. Yeah. I mean, and they're foolish to think otherwise. Is... If sports betting was legal nationally, that's not going to help Nevada. That's going to hurt Nevada, I would think. Don't know. Is this something that your commission is looking at, or is it just like we'll deal with that if it happens? Or? I don't think they're looking at that, but I think it would probably help if you want to. You know, if you want to kind of, if you want a couple of analogies. You know, first of all, the spread of online poker in the two thousands definitely helped Nevada brick and mortar. Uh, poker rooms you know they totally boomed they were they were taking poker rooms out across the state then they boomed revenues went up i think they tripled i could be wrong about that because i don't have mm-hmm. my numbers in front of me but you know i see it it's all it's only two percent of the total win anyway so it's not like they make a ton of money if you have more people familiar with it i think you would have more people doing it when they're here number two who is going to be running it you're going to have the com- the companies based in Vegas like William Hill running it and other Vegas based operators running it so i think it will benefit las vegas you know but kind of i wrote an article about this and i think that if you are a casino executive if you're the guy running the ship there's just not a lot of room for growth anymore you know so eh, we'll have casinos in massachusetts and then what's out there on the horizon texas maybe florida maybe who knows? That could be ten years from now. If Utah ever. and Hawaii are totally untapped. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you know what's really out there? Well, I don't know. And is it really likely that they're going to invent some kind of new slot machine that's going to send revenues to the roof? Well, even if they did, it'll probably be a participation game, and the manufacturers will get a cut of that. So, if you're looking to grow your market, which the shareholders want, I think like hey, even if you can only add two percent to your bottom line, that's not bad. But currently, the current trend is sports betting in Nevada is growing. It is. But total gaming revenue in Nevada is shrinking. Yeah. So as a gaming historian, do you see either or both of those trends continuing? I think the sports betting growing will. It's really hard to see where the increase in gaming is going to come from besides a natural increase because of inflation. Just because there's so many more places to gamble. 
I think that the number of people gambling, and well, I don't think it, I know it, the number of people in, who come to Vegas and gamble has actually fallen since 2007. If you look at the numbers that the LVCVA puts out, that's the Las Vegas Visitors Convention of Visitors Authority, I don't have them in front of me, but I've, I've ran them before, and it's actually about 2.1 million fewer people gambled in Vegas in 2014 than did in 2007, even though there were about 2 million more people coming to town. So not only has a proportion fallen, the absolute number has fallen, and that's people who gambled at all. And that's... Didn't. Of course, you, you still don't have the numbers, but there, the numbers of dollars gambled would be a factor. It is, yeah, and that's fallen, and that's I think that's because of the recession. People lost a lot of their portfolio and a lot of their confidence, and I don't, I just don't see that coming back in a big way because there's so many other things to spend money on here, and a lot of the casinos like the other customer better because it's more reliable. You don't have to worry about getting beat if you're, you know, if you're selling them twenty dollar burgers. I've seen some pretty big people go into buffets. I would think casinos <laughs> should be worried about that. That's still, it just it just seems like horrible management, though, to me. I mean, the the idea of being afraid of getting beat. I mean, I I, I just think that the people running the casinos don't understand the gambling business anymore, and, and so they're not profiting in, from it the way they could be uh, yeah i mean that you've got i've got I've, sometimes when i get more philosophical i like to think about okay you've got a business whose core tenet belief whatever is that you are offering people negative expectation games that's the core of the business and yet if you look at the aggregate numbers the casino companies based in nevada are still losing money that number they, you know they last made a profit i think in 2007 they last declare a profit. So I don't know how you can be running a business that offers people negative expectation games. The number of people coming to town is the highest ever, and you are still losing money. That To me, that, that takes some kind of talent. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's expensive to have the facilities to offer them these. I mean, if even if you have 2%, and these are, you know, $1.6 billion hotels or whatever the numbers are. This is... It's expensive. Yeah, yeah which is but, but as he said, you know, the numbers keep going down, and there's a reason for that, right? I mean, you have more people coming to town, but less people are gambling. Well, why is that happening? You know, and my answer would be, it's not that people change their mind and don't like gambling anymore. It's that you're providing, there's something about the way you're providing or presenting the game that people are not uh, you know, taking you up on your offer. And and my explanation would be bad management. <laughs> you think six you think six to five blackjack would be uh a, a you know good what? reason. I don't even think it's it I mean, yes, I think um as well, look at the casinos that are profitable, right? That the locals casinos are profitable and the strip casinos are not. And and the locals casinos offer looser games, looser slots, better video poker and the, than the than the strip casinos do. Um, you know, so I, I think that's part of it, but it's not just that, it's also the the as you said this fear of getting beat. You know, they they sweat the money, they glare at the at the players. They, you know, the the bosses do not want the action in the casino. They would be much happier if everybody showed up with a hundred dollar bill and bet nickels, right? Because it's not in their, they don't care if the casino wins or loses. They, all they care about is their job and if they're going to get heat from their boss, right? So if somebody comes in and bets big, there's nothing good that can happen to a pit boss having a big player in your pit, right? It's either you know, oh, he lost, so everything's okay, or the guy won, and now you're going to get heat for it. So run him out the door, <laughs> you know. All right. So we're talking to David Schwartz, and we're going to take a brief break for some commercials, and then when we come back, we're going to ask David what parts of his new book, Boardwalk Playground, were his favorite ones to write. South Point has more than 10,000 games, returning more than 99%. This is more than anybody else has. The promotion this month is called $600,000 April Showers Giveaway. Every night until 
April 30th at 8.15 p.m. One person's name will be called for $10,000. This must be claimed within four minutes or the prize reverts to $500 in free play and another name is called. Eventually, they'll have one $10,000 cash winner and 20 $500 free play winners. You do not have to physically show ID to claim the $500 in free play, but you need to play it off within seven days or it evaporates. There's a maximum of 10,000 tickets to be earned per day between 9 p.m. the night before and 8 p.m. the night of the drawing. Video poker players earn one ticket per dollar coin in. Slot players earn three tickets per dollar played. The virtual barrel is emptied after every drawing. For some reason, they have forgotten to call my name so far. This, <laughs> the, uh, when this ran in September a year and a half ago, between us, Bonnie and I got called seven times over the, uh, the month. over the 30 days. And this time so far, we've been shut out. There have been some people who uh, recognize some of the names have been called three or four times. It just happens. Um, but um, I'm st st we're still doing it every night we're in town. I still think it's a good deal. At the Palms, from now until the end of April, they have drawings every Friday and Saturday night at 7.15 p.m. Must be present to win. Five winners. Top prize, $2,500. Total of the five is $5,000. And each of those five winners gets a chance to win $1 million in the million dollar match game. The odds are only 16,500 to one against you, but you got a shot at it. PFP, play for prizes. Until this Friday, April 15th, you earn Walgreens gift cards. Cards are redeemed at a rate of 0.2% for video poker players up to $190 per day. You keep the points. For the next two weeks, you can earn gift cards to Kohl's at the same rate. That's K-O-H-L apostrophe S. In April, every Sunday and two Wednesdays, the 13th and the 27th, you earn double points. The Wednesday multipliers earn PFP awards, either Walgreens or Kohl's gift cards. The Sunday multipliers do not. There is no maximum on the number of double points you can earn although there is a maximum that qualify for the PFP awards. Each of these Wednesdays is near the end of the PFP earning period where you can collect $190 worth of PFP every day for $95,000 coin in. But they that means since there's three days, well, there's two days afterwards, the current day and two days after, after each of the... Earning period, that's $285 coin in maximum on the 2x point day that you can get the awards for. I have a suspicion this is not a big constraint to a lot of players. Yes. At videopoker.com, it's the best place to play lots of games. If you sign up for the gold membership, $8.95 a month or $79.95 a year, this allows you to get corrections on most of the game. The game of the week is 100 play, super times pay. Super Times Pay is a six coin per line game where approximately every 15 hands you receive a multiplier from 2x to 10x. These multipliers do not change your strategy at all. They just increase the expected value by about a quarter percent and they also increase the variance moderately. Higher variance for most people translates into more fun. There are member, well, that's true. Jacks are better is the video poker game, which has the lowest variance, and so many players consider that so boring. No matter what the odds are, they're not going to, they'll play double double bonus, which is a half percent tighter because double double bonus is so much fun, and jacks are better is so boring. But jacks are better super times pay, you earns a quarter percent more, and it's not quite so boring. There are member rewards for playing on the site. In April, the site is featuring Quick Quads Video Poker, and playing that game earns you twice the membership points that it normally does. We're talking to David Schwartz on his book, Boardwalk Playground. Now, David, you're uh, you're an Atlantic City boy, born and raised there. So what part of the books was like most near and dear to you from like 
personal way? Well, I think writing about the city of Ventnor City, for one, because uh, that was where I grew up and I worked in the summers for the city, so that was a lot of fun. Managed to slip a couple of inside jokes in there that probably maybe one guy would get him. I don't even know if uh, he's read the book. And also writing about the Taj was pretty cool because I worked at the Taj to Trump Taj Mahal. And that was that was a lot of fun. To be able what did to, you do with the test? I did a couple of things. I did uh, security, started out doing security, did that for a while. And then after I got my PhD, I came back and they put me upstairs in surveillance. <laughs> you must be the only person in history with a PhD that worked in surveillance. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think so. There's a lot of people, you know, I know when I was doing security and a guy to ma- his master's, so I'm not, I wouldn't be so surprised. <laughs> uh, but I, It seems now, yeah. I mean, from what I hear, you know, they hire guys for twelve dollars an hour, and and uh, uh, yeah, wow. I think like I was they... only getting eleven fifty. So <laughs> yeah, but how many years ago <laughs> yeah, was that? Was. Right? So, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, a thankless job and underpaid. Our friends in surveillance. On your website, it mentions you were sometimes Mister Peanut oh, on yeah. the boardwalk. That must have been. Um, th- really good at picking up babes huh it actually wasn't that bad you know you you had uh you know at that point i was like 19 so it was more the the babysitters not so much the the moms uh with that but you know seriously it was a lot of fun it was the the boardwalk peanut shop leo yeager it was in the at that point it was in the tropicana it was a great great job you know oh you know one thing i wanted to mention is uh Sort of the one thing that is unique about Atlantic City are those rolling chairs on the yeah. boardwalk. How did that come about? So that's basically, they got the, it, it came down, there was an exhibition in Philadelphia in 1876 where they started doing it and they just brought it down to the shore and they started doing it there because you had the long boardwalk and very restful to be pushed by another human being and you're just sitting back there talking to the person next to you and enjoying the the ocean breeze, which I might add is what made Mr. Peanut pretty bearable. You know, people a lot of times say, oh, it must have been awful with the heat and everything. It was actually really nice. You get usually usually there, you know, get in around three o'clock and you get a nice little breeze coming off the ocean. So actually really, really fun job. So you weren't in this big heavy costume that uh, cut off all the cool breeze. It was heavy, but there was two there was two kind of holes with screens in either side, so I got a nice little cr- some cross ventilation there. It's actually pretty pleasant. Uh, mm-hmm. Worst part was when you know people, some of the kids would would kick and grab, and you know some people are just kind of perverted, so they costume only came down so far, so they could kind of reach up and try to grab you, and that's a yeah. <laughs> That was, Try to know, grab some nuts. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that was so. Yeah, yeah, again, I don't know. I guess some people, you know, found the whole idea of a giant peanut kind of a turn on or something. I don't. Again, I don't know. <laughs> now with the internet, you know, everybody's got. You can find. You can find uh, that with anything. But it was one of the weirder aspects of it. You you wouldn't think, but it happened. This is the first time we've done a show about a guy who's gotten paid to have his nuts grabbed. Right. <laughs> right. All right. Very good. We've yeah. been talking to uh, David Schwartz, uh, Boardwalk Playground. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks for having me. It's, it's always great coming on with you guys. Very good. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Richard. And go out and hit lots of royal flushes, everybody. Good day. <laughs>